happy. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm <coughs> delighted to be here for RFI Group and Sky News, where I'm a presenter, um, and, and delighted, obviously, to be hosting this fireside chat. We've got 20 minutes, which is going to go really quickly. I can see some familiar faces in the audience, which is so nice. So I thought we'd start. People always introduce themselves better than, obviously, anyone else can introduce them. So Slavomir, why don't you go ahead and tell us who you are and what you do? So I've been... Uh 27 years in, in banking, uh, actually f the first five years I was in the, in the government and uh, the next 23 years uh, in the private sector. The last uh, 14 years I'm running City Handlover, which is the uh, oldest Polish bank. Uh, in 2001, 75% was bought by City and I'm excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, it's, it's a really interesting story, a 148-year-old <coughs> bank ride and then City obviously came in and, and sort of took, took the reins, 75% of it, I believe. Um, and Poland is such an interesting nation, right? We hear so much about Poland as far as innovation in Eastern Europe. You've traveled 13 hours to be here. I've traveled about eight. So I thought we'd just start off with sort of the, the key sort of, um, I guess the current environment for financial services that you're seeing. Let's talk globally, but then also let's talk about Poland specifically. All right. So, um let me maybe, uh, before I respond to your question, let me maybe give a two words of, uh, of a background. So over the quarter of, uh, of the century, uh, Poland doubled its GDP, and the financial sector uh, started uh, being built from the scratch after the uh, socialist uh, economy. So we spent about 10 years catching up the Western Europe. But in the, after the year 2000, and especially after the global financial crisis, which Polish banks actually um, uh, went through uh, unscattered, uh, the, the banks accelerated uh, its uh, uh, technology, uh, upgraded its technology, and started to play an important role, um, not only in the economy, but also uh, in the uh, financial, new financial technologies. So, Poland emerged after the 2008 as a, as a fintech place, uh, not only in Central and Eastern Europe, but also in Europe in general. Mm. Now, talking about the trends, uh, let me maybe highlight two, uh, um, two of them. The first one is the, the low interest rates. When you look at the markets in uh, Europe, but also in the US, what you observe is a, is a prolonged period of uh, low interest rates or even the negative interest rates, which triggered um, a lot of effort on the bank side to review its products, its processes, the way they deliver services to uh, clients, but also made the banks much more inclined to look for a new solutions working in partnership with uh, um, uh, with a with a fintech, so so the low interest rates is a is a very important factor as a trend not only in Poland but uh, globally. The second is the role of the regulators, and I think when I look at my regulator, I see a kind of a dichotomy. On the one side, I see the preference for soundness and uh, uh, safety of the deposits and. Uh, and especially the um, uh, responsible lending activity. But on the other hand, I see my regulator very flexible when it comes to payments, uh, transfers, FX. And FX is a good example because Polish banks uh, around 2004 to 2008 accumulated about 40 billion Swiss franc mortgages and tied the customers, forced the customers to do the exchange. Uh, at the very high spread. So what the regulator did is actually untied the contract and allowed the non-banking players to enter the FX market. Uh, so within three years, the non-banking players forced the bank to reduce the FX spreads by about 80%. So that's an example where the banks have a pain points and the regulators step in. And I think for the future, the role of regulator will be uh, very important. Do you think that the, the um, sort of, I guess, the regulatory environment in Poland is, do you think that they have a little bit more trust as in you, we, you mentioned to me that you were relatively unscathed during the global financial crisis that you just mentioned in 2008. So do you think that has let sort of the, the regulators be a little bit 
you know, freer with the, with the banking community? Um, yeah, I think that uh, the fact that uh, uh, there was no t uh, taxpayers' money invested in the banks, it played an important role, the trust from the regulator to the regulated institution, but most importantly, the, the clients of the banks uh, trust the banks. The banks uh, score in Poland as the top three trusted institutions, which I believe it varies market to market, and there are some markets where the banks are not enjoying such a high level of trust. Yeah, so you're in the right place. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I thought we'd just talk a little bit about major priorities in, in digital for your bank. You have sort of 4,000 staff. Like, I, I might be helpful for the audience if they knew that you're sort of customer base. But what you're sort of doing in the digital space, and, and particularly in the fintech space from a city and love perspective? Um, so, so basically, uh, we have retail and corporate customers uh, in the uh, retail space. Um, uh, what we've done uh, in the last five years is primarily the, um, the transformation of our physical distribution. And I think uh, we call it now the uh, uh, smart ecosystem. By the way, it started here in Singapore. We just took it from City Singapore and uh, moved it to the next level. So, to give you the perspective, we reduced the branch network over the last five years by about 75 to 80%. So, from uh, January this year, we operated in a completely uh, modern um, uh, physical uh, uh, branch network, which, uh, which looks like a bit of an Apple store. So, initially, people came to us uh, asking for the iPods and, uh, and um, uh, uh, iPhones. Uh, but most importantly, it's not what you see. I mean, it's a very modern-looking branch, but the most important is what we've done on the back-end side. Uh, leveraging the high quality of credit bureau in Poland, we are able, in about 21 minutes, to underwrite the risk of card and with the instant embossing, get you the, the ready card. So, uh, basically, we do everything digital in the, in the branch. And it's like uh, moving people, migrating people to the digital channel, which is our uh, ultimate objective. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of changing the whole experience when you go into a branch. We have, I've, I've been to a City Smart branch in Sydney. I remember when it opened and launched and it was, you know, they sort of had giving away coffee and balloons and, and it was also, it was a very sort of interesting experience going into that branch. As you said, a, a completely different, um, you know, no barriers, no walls, just kind of walking straight through, which I think is really interesting. What are some of the biggest sort of challenges and opportunities that, that you're seeing in Poland? Um, I, guess, I guess when we see things changing so rapidly within the financial services ecosystem, what are, what, what are your biggest challenges and what do you think are the biggest challenges, I guess, for you know, anybody in the room watching today? Um, not only in Poland, but uh, in the European perspective, I would uh, highlight the, the biggest change which uh, will uh, start in January 2018, which is called the PSD2, which is Payment Service Directive 2, which de facto is the regulators deciding to open the APIs of the banks to the third party providers. The third party providers could be non-banking institution or other banks, but de facto you allow the other players to manage the accounts at the, of the customers at the host bank. So what, what the risk to the incumbent players is, is de facto that this directive will stimulate the process of, of disintermediation between the, the banks and their customers, and the customers could be completely managed from outside. So how do you stay relevant then? Is this a good thing for you, or a, is it is positive? It, it's creating competition, which I think is good, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to know your view. So, it's, it's both risk and opportunity for, for the banks in Europe. I think it depends on the strategy. Some banks will assume uh, the strategy of being uh, de facto the utilities for other players. So, they will hold the accounts, uh, but someone else will run the accounts, uh, initiate payments. Uh, uh, or, you can choose to be an active player. And uh, I must say that uh, I believe that um, in Poland, uh, uh, banks are fintechs, so I strongly believe that uh, both the fintechs and the banks will compete uh, for, uh, for the new opportunities. Yeah, yeah a v very interesting point. Something else that we discussed yesterday when we met, which I thought was quite interesting, was, was very much that trust factor. You still have this ultimate trust level with your customer, right? So if you can kind of create a fantastic 
you know, fintech opportunity and, and sort of innovative experience, but you still have that trust, so you've still got them. Yes, and uh, I think it's a, it's a very important distinction. Uh, when you are a fintech in Poland, you rather choose to cooperate and build the alliances, and that's the primary model of interaction between the banks and, uh, and the fintechs. And uh, as I said, the banks are fintechs, but uh, uh, there are many new solutions being born. And by the way, in front of this uh, room, there is a big group of Polish fintechs uh, offering their services, selling it uh, also to Asia. Uh, but I think that uh, what's important is uh, the fintechs can leverage the trust of the banking sector to get an access to the, to the customers. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I mentioned to you that I really want to talk about culture, which is a topic that I loved. I love discussing in everything that I do. And you lead a, you lead a, a large team, 4,000 people from the very top. How do you create, and again, advice to people in the audience, how do you create this really amazing sort of culture of innovation, you know, startup thinking, uh, creating new ideas? What do you do at City Hand Love? So <clears throat> the most important is that... Um, Anybody who was running a company understands that the culture is, uh, is important and uh, any strategy without the culture would fail. So that's visible when, when you are in an M&A situation, but it's also so many M&As, uh, mergers and acquisitions fail because of this clash of cultures and people unable uh, to manage it. But at the same time, uh, the culture is important when you transform the industry or your institution. So what, what we believe in is uh, that to build, uh, to build the culture of uh, being close to the client and understand the client's needs. It's both for retail and the corporate client. Uh, when, uh, when you see uh, what's changing and you follow the trend or you prepare the solution alone, in-house or uh, with a partner, fintech partner, uh, you need to make people understand that the world is changing, our clients are changing, and the only way to succeed is to, um, uh, to stick uh, close to, to the clients. Uh, our motto, the, the mission uh, value proposition, is enable progress, and then is enable progress of, of our clients, and we do it in uh, three dimensions. Uh, the one is uh, the new innovative products or um, uh, business solutions. The second is the client centricity. And the third one is uh, diversity, which is um, less technical. Yeah, fantastic. Well, when you are thinking of your sort of clients and customers, we're talking about the consumer perspective there. What are some of the biggest barriers to adoption from a consumer perspective of new technologies? Are you, do you feel in Poland, for example, this is here what we're to talk about, um, there's, there's a very sort of a strong appetite for adoption? It, it is indeed. And maybe it's because the, we are first generation which went through the fundamental um, economy and social and political transformation. So people are like used to change. Um, so the adoption is uh, fairly... Uh, uh, fairly good, but the biggest barrier is that um, not everyone is a millennial, and uh, with the fintechs, we quite often talk about people getting involved in uh, social media and how they adopt to the new technologies. But the, the fact of the matter is that within our bank, we have people um, who are not only millennials but they are older. Uh, quite often, uh, they are very good clients. And by the way, in Europe, we, we face the situation that the society is aging. So I think we have to understand that. And that gives the opportunity for the role to play which goes beyond the uh, business. I strongly believe that the financial institutions should get involved in educating the clients. I believe that uh, educated client is a better client, and especially with the clients which are maybe less familiar with the technologies, there is a space where we can do a lot. And uh, I can quote that uh, you know, over the last 12 years, City Hand Love engaged in the biggest uh, education, uh, financial education program in Central and Eastern Europe. We went through the program with one and a half million um, uh, high school students. Uh, closing the gap of how they are using the modern banking. And we also do uh, similar studies in uh, what's called the third age university, 
which is the elderly people. And I think that's a very important part of the environment we operate in. I, I love that your point there on education is key, and I like that you are sort of driving that. So it's, would you say it, is, it, it has to come from the bank then, from the sort of traditional provider to then educate, or does it come from the customer asking? I think that it's, um, uh, our experience is that uh, it was an initiative of the, of the bank. I think that I would say that uh, it would be great to have, for example, the government and the education system um, like participating on joining the forces. That's not the case so far, but uh, I believe there is a role and responsibility of the financial institution. Yeah, I agree. I think we can see globally trends of that happening so much more. We, uh, we had a speaker welcome dinner on Monday night and the Minister for Singapore mentioned, I, I mentioned to you, so that, uh, you know, uh, students throughout Singapore need to go through, you know, all these different courses. Now it's in the curriculum for every single university to be sort of, you know, coding and technology and doing all this. We've got five minutes to go these things go super fast as they always do. What's the next big thing? There's the big question. That, that, financial services and fintech, I should th say. That's interesting. I believe that uh, uh, from what we know, the, the, the next big thing is, uh, is AI. I believe that will have a substantial impact on the way we engage with clients, the way we do the middle and back office, and uh, what we do in terms of the cybersecurity AML KYC, which is less popular but very important in terms of the, um, the, our investment. So I believe the AI will be the, the next big thing. However, having said this, what, after so many years, uh, five, six, seven, maybe eight, uh, what, what's different and what is the next big thing is like looking at the event similar to what Amazon did to retail uh, business, right? So, so far, the financial sector has not observed, has not seen anything uh, which would impact the industry the way the retail was impacted by Amazon or the social media impacted the journalism. We haven't seen that. Uh, partially, it's uh, probably uh, we are doing some things right. Uh, partially, maybe, it's uh, also to think for the fintechs why it's not as successful as others. Yeah. It's interesting you point out those points, I think, for the journalism perspective. Luckily, robots, they aren't being, robots aren't presenting yet, so I'm still up here with a job, which is great. <laughs> um, global markets that you look at, uh, I know you look, obviously, at Poland internally, and here we are in Asia, but what are some global markets that you see as fantastic stories of success, doing things really well that perhaps we can all look to? Um, it will not be obvious what I say, but uh, I think uh, in European Union, I would point out at uh, Estonia as a digital country. And I think that uh, for many countries and the governments, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, a best practice to follow. They, they scored very high this year in the digital development index. And I think that uh, when uh, we talk about the environment for fintechs and uh, transformation, of the country, both social, political, business. Estonia is a good country to look at. And uh, being in Singapore, as especially that Estonia is taking over the chairmanship in the European Union, I would very much highlight uh, that country as a model. It's, it's a good one. It's always good to hear different countries to look at around the world there. Um, I think, like, just interestingly, I'd kind of like to close on a little bit more about you, as in, why you do what you do, what drives and inspires you in business, and, and I guess some sort of future priorities. What would you like to achieve over the next 12 months, five years, 10 years? Uh, what inspires me is uh, my curiosity. I wake up every morning uh, knowing that I learn something new, and that's uh, tremendous. And uh, when I look back, uh, in the early 90s, I led the Polish government effort to transform the banking sector from the centrally planned economy to the market institution. And it looks like before I uh, uh, retire, I'm uh, participating in the digital transformation, which is the second revolution when I look from my uh, Poland's market perspective. That's really great, and my curiosity matches that uh, historical development very, very well. What I want to achieve is... Uh, for um, to be always uh, good for the client, the best for the clients, and 
helped my team to go smoothly and successfully through the transformation. Of course, I want uh, also my kids to succeed in the world where, um, as we know, 50% um, of the jobs which are being done by people and people are paid for uh, will be or have a potential to be replaced by the existing technology. So there is no chance that they will choose a job and stay for the 40 years of their career. So I think I have a role to play as well. Yeah, I, I love that you brought that up. I think it's a really interesting point. And, and your family as well. You know, you mentioned you have children and, and it's what they will do in the future. I mean, the future is changing and jobs are changing and there needs to be something for everyone to do. Correct. Well, thank you. We're, we're actually out of time. Thank you so much for joining us for the fireside chat. Um, please join me in thanking Savamir.